Okay, today we're going to be in Chapter 5, uh, Gasoline Engine Systems. So this is uh, kind of a, a quick review on um, how the gasoline engine works. So hopefully this shouldn't be new information for you yet. This should be just kind of a review for you. So can anybody tell me what the four strokes of the engine are? For first one, what's the first one? Intake. Intake. What's the next one? Compression. Compression. What's that? Power. Yeah, so the combustion happens and pushes the piston down, so that's power. So intake, compression, power, and what's the last one? Exhaust. So the piston goes up and down four times. It goes up once, down is number two, up is number three, down is number four. So the piston travels up and down four times. How many times does the crankshaft turn around? <laughs> you have to think about this for a minute, don't you? <laughs> so the crankshaft turns around twice. So when the piston's at top dead center, it goes down to the bottom. That's 180 degrees. Then it comes back up to the top. That's another 180, so that's 360. Then it goes down to the bottom, another 180, and then all the way back up to the top, which is another 180, which is a total of 720. So in your canvas underneath this chapter, I did link a video there where I uh, used that engine cutaway block there and demonstrated, you know, talked a little bit about the components of the engine and then demonstrated the, uh, the four strokes of the engine there. So that's some of the things we're going to be talking about in this chapter. We're going to cover um, the four strokes of the engine. We're going to cover a little bit of the components that are inside the engine. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that because you should have already had that in your engines class. So uh, we'll just go ahead and move forward. So. First of all, the engine block that we have. The engine block is uh, what actually holds everything together. So I know you can't see this very well, especially those in the back. But you've got, uh, this one here happens to be a cast iron block. And so the block is going to be where everything is kind of, that's the body of the engine. That's what everything's held into. And then everything is attached to it. So you got your cylinder heads on, that sit on top of the engine block. You got your oil pan that goes on the bottom of the engine block. You got your front cover, your intake manifold, all that kind of stuff bolts onto the cylinder block. So um, that's your engine block. So it's usually constructed of cast iron or aluminum. Most of the engines nowadays are aluminum. You don't see very many cast iron engines anymore. Why did they change from cast iron to aluminum? Isn't cast iron stronger? Yeah, it's all weight. It's all about weight. And this ties in to our discussion that we're going to have later on in the quarter about uh, emissions, exhaust emissions. The lighter you can make the car, the less push water you need to make it go down the road. So the heavier your car, the more gasoline it's going to take to drive down the road. So if you make the car lighter, so in other words, if you lighten it up a little bit, you're going to use less gas. And if you use less gas, you're going to pump out less pollutants into the atmosphere. And so that's the whole idea. And so they're always looking for ways to lighten the, the load on the car. Um, that's why they've uh, gone to bi-directional communication on the networks and stuff inside the car, is now you can use one wire to perform many different functions instead of one single wire for each function. So back in the old days, it used to be that you had a hot wire and a ground wire for every single thing that you were doing on the car. And does anybody have any idea of how much a wire harness may weigh? Take a wild guess. It's amazing. Typical, yeah, tip, what's that? More, way more. Yeah. Well, Honda, uh, oh, well, let's, let's, uh, let's put some parameters around it. Uh, like a regular, say like a, a, uh, Crossover SUV. So you've got something that's kind of mid-size. It's not really full-size. It's not really uh, compact, but a mid-size SUV. 150. Higher. Uh, 300. <laughs> you could almost get up as high as 500 pounds of, of wire in a car. It's amazing. I mean, I was shocked when I saw that, and it, but I've read a lot of different... Uh, I've never actually pulled a wire harness out and weighed it. But um, I've read a lot of different uh, information that, 
they're saying that anywhere from about 300 to as much as 500 pounds in, in weight. And so if we can lighten that a little bit, so if we can use, that's why they played around a little bit with fiber optics back in the late 90s, because fiber optic cable is really light and you can do a lot of stuff and it's extremely fast. It, the electrons can travel through it at the speed of light. And, uh, but the downside to that is it's difficult to repair and it breaks real easy. So they also tried um, Bluetooth communication, you know, those short networks and stuff, so everything was wireless. Well, that's all well and good until you drive under one of those great big power lines. Now you got electromagnetic interference, and so everything kind of scrambles when you drive. So that didn't work out very well. So the best thing we've got is we've got the bidirectional communication and stuff, which has lightened the load quite a bit. If you take a wire harness out of a car from the 70s, it's going to weigh way more than a wire harness out of a, the similar car in the 2000s. So. It's kind of interesting to think about stuff like that. But anyway, that's why they uh, switched from uh, cast iron to aluminum. There's some different challenges with that. Um, aluminum expands and contracts at, uh, at a bigger rate than cast iron does. Cast iron doesn't move as much. And so when they first started switching from cast iron to aluminum blocks, what do you suppose some of the problems that we as technicians saw quite a bit of? I can speak from experience because I was working in the industry about the time they were switching from cast iron to aluminum. Yeah, overheating problems. We had uh, uh, leaks, coolant leaks, oil leaks, stuff like that because they were still using cast iron heads and aluminum cylinder blocks. Those two metals expand and contract at different rates. Their gasket technology hadn't caught up. And so it wasn't sealing, the seals would break and stuff like that. So we had a lot of intake manifold gaskets leaking. We had a lot of head gaskets leaking. We had a lot of oil pan gaskets leaking, stuff like that. Since then, the gasket technology has improved. The metallurgy has improved. And so we don't have a lot of those problems anymore. There's still some cars that do, but not for the most part. Inside the cylinder block, we have what is called the rotating assembly. So this is the rotating assembly, this is the crankshaft, the pistons, connecting rods, everything that spins around inside the engine. So the basic function of the engine is to take reciprocating motion, which is up and down, and change it to rotary motion, which is round and round and round. And so, and then the differential takes that, that reciprocating mo or that, that circular motion and changes it to a directional motion. So you've got uh, several different transfers of, of uh, energy there. But this is the uh, rotating block or the rotating assembly inside the, the engine. And it consists of uh, piston, connecting rods, uh, crankshaft, uh, things like that. Then we have the cylinder heads. The cylinder heads bolt right on top of the cylinder block. And so if we're looking at this, uh, cylinder block over here. I've got part of a cylinder head bolted onto it right here. You can see this little chunk right there, but normally this whole thing would be covered with a cylinder head. The cylinder head does a couple of things. It seals the cylinder, so you've got when you, your, your piston comes up on compression stroke, it, uh, it has a place to seal that, to compress that, that air, air fuel charge. And uh, then it also, the, the cylinder head also seals up coolant passages, oil passages, and different things like that. And it also houses where the valves are. So these are all the valves in the cylinder head. So we've got big valves and small valves. Anybody familiar enough with engines that know, do you know which valves are intake and which ones are exhaust? A good rule of thumb is the big valves are going to be intake valves, the small valves are going to be exhaust valves. Because when your engine's coming, when your piston's coming down on, on intake stroke, what you're actually doing is that piston's coming down and the rings seal against the cylinder. So it's creating a pressure less than atmospheric in, up on top of the piston. So in other words, it's creating a vacuum. And because there's a pressure less than atmospheric on top of the piston, the atmospheric pressure is pushing air through the intake manifold down into the cylinder. So as the piston comes down, it's basically sucking air into the engine. So um, that, in order to increase that, if we can get more air in the engine, 
when we come up and compress it and fire it, it's going to have more power. And so if we bake these valves bigger, we can get a little bit more air into the, the combustion chamber. And there's other ways to get more air into it as well. We can add a turbocharger, we can add a supercharger, we can tune the intake manifold, we can uh, overlap the valves and all that kind of stuff to get a little bit more air into the, the combustion chamber. But that's the whole idea. Um, you guys probably know this already, but uh, if you look at some of the, the horsepower and different uh, ratios that we used to have from the muscle car era back in the 60s and 70s, and then look at the modern little cars that, that people are racing around now and stuff, you can almost get the same amount of power out of a much smaller power plant. And it's because of some of the technology that we're using. So uh, we're, the engines are much more efficient nowadays than they used to be. You can get more or you can get a lot more power out of a smaller unit, which makes it nicer to drive. Back in the 60s and 70s, if you had a little small compact car, you can forget about power. <laughs> it wasn't happening. <laughs> and back then, the, the idea was, if you want more power, put a bigger engine in it. <laughs> if you want more power out of your engine, then you put bigger pistons in it. You put a bigger intake on it. You know, just make things bigger. Well, when you make things bigger, you're going to drink more gas. So, um, I don't know, anybody have an old car from like the 60s or 70s? What's your fuel economy if you do? <laughs> I had a 72 Blazer. Yeah, my 72 Blazer, it, it chewed up about uh, whew, almost five gallons of gas just coming to work from Rochester. You know, uh, that can get expensive nowadays when gas is four bucks a gallon sometimes. Luckily, we're not at four bucks a gallon right now. But So anyway, that's the cylinder head. So the cylinder head's job is to seal the combustion chamber. It also houses the intake and the exhaust valves, and it also provides a place where the intake manifold can connect to it and the exhaust manifold can connect. So air coming in, going through the combustion chamber and then the air leaving, that's all facilitated by the cylinder head. And then intake and exhaust manifolds. So the intake is just what it says. It brings air in and regulates the amount of air coming into the engine and the exhaust allows air out and regulates air out of the engine. One of the ways that you can increase power on an engine is increase the amount of air coming in. Another way you can increase power a little bit is increase air going out. That air coming in and air going out of the engine, there's a term for it. Does anybody know what the term is? It's called volumetric efficiency. And basically with vol volumetric efficiency, that just refers to how well does the engine breathe. And to get a really good engine that's going to produce uh, um, good power and it's going to get f good fuel economy and everything, it has to be able to breathe properly. I think about it just like you. If you're, just, if you're jogging down the road, running down the road, if you can inhale really well, but for whatever reason, maybe you're wearing a mask or something, you can't exhale very well, are you going to be able to run very fast or very far? And vice versa. If you can't inhale very well, but you can exhale just fine, you're still not going to run very well. Well, the engine's no different. It's got to be able to inhale. It's got to be able to exhale. And so that's kind of uh, one of those funny things. I always kind of laugh to myself because, you know, guys, people, they want to they um, modify their cars. They want to get a little bit more power. So they spend a ton of money and they modify the intake and they put the big intake runners on there and they put cold air injection and all this kind of stuff on it. But they don't do anything with the exhaust. The exhaust is still stock. You'll, get, you'll, gain, you'll get some gains. You'll get uh, more power. You'll get more benefit out of your modifications you're doing on your intake. But you'll get actually more if you actually modify the exhaust as well. So if you modify the intake and the exhaust at the same rate so that you keep your engine balanced, then you're going to get more benefit for the money you're spending. And a lot of people, you know, they like to put headers on there or something. Well, headers will give you a gain, but if you don't increase your intake, you're not going to get as much of a gain. You'll get some. So it depends on your cash flow and what you, your ability, your skill level, all that kind of stuff. So, but it is kind of uh, uh, fun to play around with that kind of stuff sometimes too. But that's the intake and the exhaust. They basically just control the in, air coming in air going out of the engine. Cooling system, 
What's the main job? Why do we have a cooling system? Yep. Keep the engine operating at an optimal temperature. Now, does anybody know what the temperature is that most engines operate at? Yeah. Just below 200 degrees. So 180, 190 degrees, somewhere around there. That's a, that's a good temperature. That most cooling fans will turn on. They'll s kick on somewhere around just a little over 200 degrees or something. I know some GM cars will kick on at 210 degrees. Um, but they operate the engine um, right around that mark. And the reason that they, mar they operate the engine at that, at that temperature is to, more, uh, to help the, the combustion happen a little more efficiently. Gasoline, we're going to talk a lot about gasoline as the quarter moves on. But gasoline doesn't burn very well in a liquid state. You want it to be and, and at a, in a vapor state. When gasoline is in a total vapor, it's kind of a little uncontrollable. It's very unstable. And so what we want is we want to deliver the fuel into the engine at kind of that happy medium in between vapor and liquid. And so that's the job of the fuel injector is to atomize the fuel. Before the fuel injector, we had a carburetor that had a jet that would as the air would come into the carburetor, it would atomize the fuel, very similar to the way the, the fuel injector does. And so the cooling system keeps it at an optimal temperature so that that atomized fuel and air mixture that gets into the combustion chamber ignites and burns very easily, con completely, and controllably so that we have a good even burn all the way across. We don't have leftover gas in the cylinder. We don't have we don't run out of gas, so we don't have leftover air in the cylinder. What do you think is the tailpipe emission for a perfect combustion on gasoline engines? What's coming out of the tailpipe? What gas do you think is coming out of the tailpipe? If you have, yep, CO2 and H2O. That's what's coming out the tailpipe if you have perfect combustion. Now, how often does perfect combustion ever happen? <laughs> You bounce back and forth past it. I mean, it'll go through perfect combustion, then it'll go to the rich side, and then it'll bounce back and go to the lean side, and you know, vice versa. So we don't hit perfect combustion a whole bunch. And we're going to talk a lot more about, there's a reason for that, too. We're going to talk a lot more about why we don't. Because uh, with our computer technology and our software abilities and stuff like that, we could actually keep the car very close to uh, perfect combustion, which is called stoichiometric. Uh, mixture. We could keep a stoichiometric mixture almost 90% of the time if we wanted to. There's a reason we bounce bef uh, higher and lower, so rich and lean and rich and lean and rich and lean. And it has to do with emissions again. So, but anyway, that's the job of the cooling system is to keep the, the engine at an operating temperature where it's efficient, it doesn't overheat, the metals last a long time, the gaskets last a long time. And, and everything else. So that's the job of the cooling system. We start talking about hybrid vehicles, and hybrid vehicles actually have a feature on a lot of them that it's kind of like a hot water storage tank. It'll, you, have you ever uh, noticed like on an old Toyota Prius, you shut it off and you're walking away from the car and the car sounds almost like something turns on. What it's doing is it's sucking all that hot coolant and putting it in a storage tank that will keep that, that coolant at a, temp, at a pretty high temperature for about 24 hours. And then when you start the car up again, maybe the next morning or a couple hours from now, you come back out, you start the car up again, it pumps that hot water right back into the engine, so now your engine's instantly hot. And so it doesn't have to warm up as much. Yep, that's it. Yeah, it, yeah, it's really close. <laughs> it's really close. I was told one time that the, that hot water tank will hold the water at over at close to 200 degrees for 36 hours, but I don't really believe that. I think it's going to cool off, uh, but it does keep the end. I mean, overnight, even in winter time, overnight the coolant will be warmer. Uh, coming out of that tank than the coolant sitting in the radiator. But anyway, that's the reason. Um, remember we talked a little bit, I mentioned open loop and closed loop yesterday when we were going through that, that, that uh, chapter. 
Closed loop is when the engine is operating on feedback from the oxygen sensor. Open loop is when the engine is delivering fuel based on a set program, uh, coolant temperature and throttle position sensor. So um, that's the difference between open and closed loop. Closed loop is where the, the, our, our, our goal is to get that car into closed loop as soon as possible. When we first started using open and closed loop, that's when fuel injection came out. That's the old throttle body days. So that was late 80s, early 90s. So when we started seeing a lot of fuel injection, we started using those terms, open loop and closed loop. Um, back, in that, back then, in a late 80s car, sometimes would take up to two minutes to go from open loop to closed loop. So, and if you put a five gas analyzer on a car like that, if it's in open loop, your hydrocarbons are through the roof. You're throwing unburned fuel out into the atmosphere like crazy. And then as soon as it goes into closed loop, those hydrocarbons take a dive. They go right down under the, the legal limit. And so that's why we want to get it into closed loop as fast as possible. So one of the ways we do that is with the cooling system, keep the engine hot, get it hot as quick as possible and keep it at a temperature um, the entire time you're operating. The other thing we do to get it into closed loop quickly is we heat up the oxygen sensor. The faster the oxygen sensor comes online and starts working, the quicker it'll go into closed loop. So that's when we started going from single wire oxygen sensors to two wire, three wire, and four wire oxygen sensors because now we can put a heater on there. And so as soon as you turn the key on, it's kind of like a glow plug. It turns on the, the oxygen sensor, it starts heating it up. So now the oxygen sensor will heat up in 30 seconds. And so a lot of times on cars, you're in closed loop 15, 20, 30 seconds after you start instead of two minutes, you know? So, and then also, we've also uh, changed the algorithms in the PCM and stuff so that um, it used to be that if you're sitting at a stop sign, the old cars would bounce back into open loop because the oxygen sensor would cool down and it wasn't reporting anymore. And then you start, you go down the road and it heats back up and starts feedback. And so you would bounce back and forth out of open loop into closed loop uh, as you're driving and especially when you stop. And nowadays, it, once it goes into closed loop, it stays in closed loop until you shut the car off. And if it doesn't stay in closed loop on a modern car, uh, I'm talking like 96 and newer, um, then you got a problem if it goes into open loop. The only, the only exception to that is on some cars, if you hit wide open throttle, sometimes it does bounce back into open loop, but it should go right back into closed loop as soon as you get out of, out of uh, you know, go fast mode. So anyway, so that's cooling system. Uh, the main part of the cooling system is your thermostat. This is part of our drivability issue. So here's, a, here's how we can relate this to drivability. You have a car coming in that's running rich. If you have a thermostat that's stuck open, is that going to influence? How do you think it'll influence? It's not good. Yeah, it's not going to heat up. It, the engine's going to be running too cold. And so you, there is a definite possibility that you'll have a rich condition because you're not warming that gasoline up to get it to, to vaporize and to burn efficiently. Opposite is true. You get a thermostat that's stuck closed. Now your engine's running hot. You're running over 200 degrees when you're supposed to be running at 180, right? So if it's stuck closed a little bit, is that going to create a drivability issue possibly? It could create a lean condition because now you're, you're vaporizing the fuel before it needs to be. So you could actually have some issues that are created just by this little guy right here. Thermostats are five bucks, maybe 10 bucks if you get the fancy ones. But you know, they're not very expensive. So there is ways to test them. You can actually test a thermostat, to see if it's working and stuff. To be honest with you, the only time I've ever tested a thermostat is to prove that that was what the problem was before I replaced it. Because they're so cheap, I'm gonna put a new one in. If I take the old one out, I'm putting a new one in. I'm not gonna worry about, you know, but Sometimes it's nice to know why it failed rather than just replacing the part. And so I'll test the, the thermostat occasionally just to prove that that's what was causing the problem. But anyway, that's a cooling system. And drivability techs, we don't have to worry too much about cooling systems, but how often should you service a cooling system? 
Yes, service information should be recommended. If you don't have access to that and you're just going by rule of thumb, on the 100,000 mile coolant, how often really should it be changed? They say 100,000 miles, but is that really true? What's that? Every couple of years is a good rule of thumb, so every two or maybe three years, drain the, flush the cooling system out. Because even with the 100,000 mile stuff, it still gets corrosive and, and acid, or acid builds up inside it and all that kind of stuff. There's pH strips that you can use to determine how good your coolant is and all that. So it is good to maintain and keep that stuff. Now, lubrication system is also another very important part that can affect engine performance. So the lubrication system, that's just your oiling system, okay? So just kind of a, use your imagination a little bit and tell me, can you figure out, okay, is there a way that if the cooling system isn't, I mean, sorry, if the lubrication system isn't working properly, how can that affect drivability? That's what I was looking for. Yeah, more friction in the engine. The way the engine actually operates is uh, you've got your, connect or your, your crankshaft here, and the connecting rod, when it clamps onto the, the crankshaft, there's a very thin layer of oil that is uh, pumped into the, that bearing surface. So the connecting rod actually is riding on oil. It doesn't actually touch the crankshaft. So you've got a thin layer of oil that goes in between the connecting rod and the crankshaft as it spins around. And that's why um, a car that has uh, driven the freeway its whole life usually gets more, you get more mileage out of that engine, or yeah, more mileage out of that engine than a car that's driven stop and go around town. So you know that old adage that, uh, oh, this car was owned by a little old lady. She only drove it to the grocery store and to church on Sunday. And so this is a great car to get. Well, not necessarily, because it was only driven once in a while and it was only driven in stop and go. <laughs> it probably never got up to operating temperature. And so there's a lot of wear that happens on the engine when those things happen. You know, when you're driving in stop and go traffic, that's why a lot of times with, uh, well, it also has to do with emissions too. The idle stop mode that are on, that's on a lot of cars now, you pull up to a stop sign, what happens to the engine? Shuts off. And uh, that happens on a lot of newer cars. I rented a car over the summertime and uh, pull up to a stop sign. It wasn't even a hybrid or anything. It was just a regular, I uh, can't remember what it was. It was a Jeep. It was a Jeep Grand Cherokee. That's what it was. Pull up to a stop sign, engine shuts off. There's a couple of reasons for that. Um, when you're uh, stop and go driving and, and stuff, that's a lot of wear on the engine. The other thing that, that happens is when you're sitting at an idle, that is the dirtiest mode that you can put your car in. So your car is going to be polluting the most when it's sitting there at an idle. And also, if you shut the car off every time you stop, you're not going to use that gas. So you can increase the fuel economy of the vehicle, which is something the manufacturers have to pay attention to. They have to build cars that, that have a certain amount of fuel economy. And then it also protects the tailpipe output on there and so uh, with the lubrication uh, on the thing you, it's good to have really good lubrication if you notice on a lot of the newer cars they're starting to use um, synthetic oils a lot more than than the old oils and the reason for that is simply because it's a better oil it lubricates a little bit better and it leaves a little residual film that uh, so you don't have metal on metal contact when you first start it up anymore and a lot of these vehicles that have the auto stop feature on them, they require synthetic oils, a lot of them do. And that's part of the reason for that, because the synthetic oils are a lot better. I used to have an old 1950 Chevy pickup. And back in those days, you, there was two basic types of oil, detergent and non-detergent. <laughs> and when I, when I had that truck when I was in high school, I used to drive it around. Um, I used to buy the oil back in, in those days um, at the auto parts store. They had a couple of drums at the very back of the auto parts store where you can bring in your own container and you buy the oil in bulk. You just pump it out into a gallon jug or whatever you want. And I used to buy the oil by the gallon for that thing. Because number one, the ga every gasket on that engine leaked. And it didn't matter how many times I changed it, they just leaked. 
and the oil, the pistons, the oil ring and stuff didn't seal very well, so they're blowing a lot of uh, oil past the the combustion rings and the the oil ring and stuff like that. So, but and the other thing is, have you ever wondered why most people can or why hundred thousand miles is kind of one of those benchmarks for a car? If it has a hundred thousand miles on it, you know. And then if it's over 100,000 miles, a lot of times people don't worry about the mileage after that. But why is that 100,000? What's, what's special about 100,000 miles? Warranties, a lot of warranties go up to 100,000 miles. But even more so than that is back in the day, back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and even into the 70s, 100,000 miles, your car was done. You threw it away. You, you got a new engine. <laughs> Because the oil technology we had, the metallurgy we had back then, wasn't very wasn't good enough, and engines wore out at 100,000 miles. It was not uncommon at all to rebuild engines with 60, 70, 80,000 miles on them. Nowadays, that's almost unheard of. I mean, I don't even buy a car until it has 100,000 miles on it. I drive old pieces of crap all the time, and and uh, all my cars, every single one of them have. Oh, actually. The only, the only vehicle I own is my motorcycle that has less than 200,000 miles on it. So if you, if you maintain your vehicle and you keep good oil in it and all that kind of stuff, it's easy to get 200,000 miles out of a car nowadays. Uh, when Cadillac came out with their North Star engine, they were touting this engine as uh, in, almost indestructible. They said that if you lost all of your coolant, you still should be able to drive it 100 miles in the Mojave Desert uh, in the middle of the summertime without it overheating. And they also said that if you lost all your oil, you should still be able to get 30 or 40,000 miles out of it even with no oil in it. And the way they were doing that is with the cooling system, when you lost all your coolant and the engine started heating up, it would shut off injectors one at a time let that cylinder cool down a little bit and then they would rotate it around and another cylinder would shut off and so forth and so we actually tried it on a car we had a car the when those North Stars first came out they had wrist pin knocking uh, noises that were and so we at the time uh, the factory was still trying to figure out what was going on with it so every time a car came in with a wrist pin noise we pulled the engine out crated it up send it off to Detroit and put a brand new engine in the car so we didn't tear it down, we didn't do anything. So we had a car come in with a wrist pin noise, so we knew we had to put an engine in it. So me and a buddy of mine, hey, let's see how long it runs without oil. We gotta send it back to Detroit anyway, right? <laughs> Customer's not gonna worry about it, they're getting a brand new engine. So we drained all the oil out of it, put, parked it outside, and put a throttle stick on it and let it run. We finally turned the car off after 45 minutes with no oil. It was still running. Every light and the whistle was blowing on the on the dash, but it was still running and it wasn't making noise either. It was it was incredible. I I if I hadn't have seen it, I wouldn't have believed it. So, but anyway, so that's the the oil lubrication system. The passages where the oil travels through the engine, those are called galleys. So if you didn't know that or if you'd forgotten that, um, and. The oil pump down here has a sump in the bottom, and uh, so it pumps oil up through the galleys and pressurizes the system. Does anybody know approximately how much pressure your oil system generates? Right around, cruising down the road, my Suburban um, uses about 40 PSI going down the road. Uh, some vehicles are a lot higher than that, some are a little bit lower look at your owner's or your service information. One of the tasks that you've got to do in the class is to do an oil system pressure test. So to do an oil system pressure test you're going to find your uh, your oil pressure sender. So the little thing that turns the light on on the dash, you're going to find that. You're going to unscrew it, you're going to screw a gauge into it, start up the car and look at the gauge. Pretty easy. And that oil pressure sender is usually mounted right by the uh, oil filter. So it's usually close by the oil filter somewhere. So, but anyway, so uh, that those are called galleys. It pumps the oil up and it gets up. The oil will come up through the push rod up here, and then gravity feeds it right back down to the engine oil pan. I had a student a few years ago. He he built a it was a really nice SS Chevelle, 
brought it in here and was running it on the dyno. Beautiful car. Did a really good job restoring it. Anyway, uh, we were running it, and we did a couple of power runs on the, on the dyno, and he had a lifter that started ticking. And so we stopped so we didn't blow the engine, but uh, he did a little bit of research on it, was trying to figure out why the lifter started ticking. Well, long story short, he had installed a, a high volume oil pump when he built the engine, thinking that, okay, I'm gonna use this as kind of a hot rod, so I wanna make sure I got enough oil in there. But what he forgot to do is put a high volume oil pan on it. And so that high volume oil pump was sucking the oil pan dry. And his lifters were starving for oil. So he put the stock oil filter back, or the oil pump back on it, and everything was fine. The stock oil pump supplied enough oil pressure for his, his purposes. So, but it took him a little while to figure that out. We didn't figure it out in class, he figured it out on his own. But I was kind of curious, so I asked him if he ever figured that out, and that's what he told me. So, then we get into the fuel system. Um, so with the fuel system, we've got the fuel tank, fuel lines, the, the delivery system. So we've got the, and during the quarter, we're going to be talking about the fuel tank and the EVAP system. The EVAP system, what its job is, it collects all the hydrocarbons from the evaporating fuel. And it stores them in a charcoal canister. And then it routes the hydrocarbons back into the intake under certain conditions to be burned. Back in the old days, we just vented that to the atmosphere. So, um, but anyway, so we have that, we have fuel lines, uh, we have fuel injectors that uh, spray. Have you heard the, the um, well, we haven't got to spark plugs yet, but there's engines that are coming out now that uh, don't have spark plugs, gasoline engines. Yeah, they're uh, um, creating it so it operates like a diesel. So that it's going to fire the, the, the um, air fuel mixture with com the heat of the compression rather than having a spark fire it. The other thing that I haven't seen come out in production yet, but I've heard that they've, they're working on, is instead of having mechanical valves that are operated by the camshaft, they're going to use solenoids to open and close valves, which that is awesome. I mean, if you think about it, because now you can change your performance on your engine with a program with a PCM program rather than components because if you can leave the valves open longer or open them at different times and all that kind of stuff it's a whole lot easier than changing out camshafts and all that kind of stuff so anyway that's the fuel system and we're going to spend quite a bit of time on fuel systems I'll show you how to clean fuel injectors and all that kind of stuff throughout the quarter um, so now the, the four stroke of the engine kind of like uh, what we were talking about at the very beginning this morning. Uh, the first four stroke engine was developed by a German engineer, Nicholas Otto, in 1876. So, um, and most automobile engines use a four stroke cycle for events. Um, there is four stroke, there are two stroke engines. We don't see a whole lot of two stroke engines out there anymore. Um, pretty much the only two stroke engines you'll see are in, is like in yard equipment and stuff like that chainsaws, weed eaters, stuff like that will have two stroke. It used to be, yeah, anybody ever have a dirt bike that's uh, two stroke? I used to own a couple. Those things are fun because uh, they, uh, they have a pretty extreme power band sometimes on those, on those two stroke dirt bikes. Um, so the four strokes, kind of like we were talking about at the very beginning, intake, compression, power, exhaust. Uh, so you have a, there's another way to remember it, just suck, squeeze, bang, blow. That works too. So um, the four stroke of the engine, that's, that's what we're doing there. And this just describes um, the, the four stroke cycle. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, ignition when, when we fire the, the cylinder. Um, probably next week we're going to cover ignition systems. And just to give you a little teaser on that, um, when the piston comes up to the compression stroke, does anybody know how long it takes to burn the, the fuel? There's a set time and it, the fuel burns at a certain rate and it mostly depends on the speed of the engine or the piston going up and down, but there is a rough 
time amount that it takes to burn the, the cylinder. Anybody know what it is? About three milliseconds. That's when you're sitting at an idle. When you're cruising down the road or, or wide open throttle or something like that, that time's going to get a little bit shorter. But mostly at, a, at an idle, it's going to take three milliseconds to burn the cylinder. So if you increase the, the um, speed of the piston, um, you want the, the spark to fire when the piston is on its way down on the power stroke. So I always think about it like a, uh, a bicycle. You know, if you've ever ridden a bicycle and you have the foot crank on there, So this is your pedal right there that you push down on when you're cranking the bike. When the pedal is in this position right here, which is about 10 degrees after top dead center, so if this right here is top dead center, the pedal is about 10 degrees after, you're going to have a lot more power with your push, right? If you step on the pedal when it's up in this position, are you going to get very much power out of it? Probably not. So if you move it over here, now you're going to get a lot of power out of it. So we want the combustion in the, in the chamber to be fully inflamed and pushing down on that piston at about this point. Now, if it takes three milliseconds to burn the, f the fuel, the faster we go, the sooner we need to start the spark. So we start the spark and start it burning, and so when the, the combustion reaches its complete combustion, you're at about 10 degrees, so you can push that piston down. And so that's why we have uh, timing that's a uh, advanceable timing so the timing advances with your speed with your engine speed and stuff like that so ignition occurs at the beginning of the power stroke and combustion drives drives the piston down to produce the power and then after that event takes place then the piston comes back up and blows all that unburnt or all that uh, exhaust gas out the exhaust pipe and if you have complete combustion you're going to use up all of your fuel you're going to use up all of your oxygen. The only thing you're going to have left is carbon dioxide, CO2, and then the hydrogen and oxygen molecules can combine creating H2O. So, and that that's, takes place with heat and all that kind of stuff. So, is this making sense so far? So, this is basically just showing you the intake stroke. So, we've got the intake valve that's open. Piston's going down, it's going to be drawn air into the combustion chamber. Then we have the compression stroke, so the, piston, the intake valve closes, it, the exhaust valve is closed, piston's coming up and it's compressing that air fuel mixture. And when it compresses it, it also heats it up. So one of the things, the job of the cooling system, if you've ever taken an engine apart and looked at it, the cooling system usually goes right around the cylinder. And part of the reason that the cooling system goes around the cylinder is to get these walls of the cylinder nice and warm so that fuel, when it comes into the combustion chamber, it doesn't, um, what's the word I'm looking for, condense on the side of the cylinder. Because remember I t said gasoline doesn't burn very well when it's liquid. So if, it, if you got a cold cylinder, it condenses on the side, it doesn't burn. So now you got extra fuel, you're going to be running a little bit lean, you're going to be blowing hydrocarbons out the tailpipe. So. Anyway, combustion or compression uh, stroke, both valves are closed, piston pushes up, compresses the air fuel mixture. Then we spark it, we ignite the fuel, and piston starts traveling down. At the same time the piston starts traveling down, the exhaust valve starts to open. So when the piston reaches bottom dead center, the exhaust valve is fully open, and then we start pushing the exhaust out. So as soon as we fire the piston, we start opening the exhaust valve. And so now we're going to talk a little bit too about EGR. You guys know what EGR stands for? I'm throwing all these terms out here because these are the terms we're going to be talking about this quarter. Exhaust gas recirculation. Does it, do you know what it does? Why we have it? No, it actually does the opposite. <laughs> but it does do something for emissions. So, did, were you going to say something, Joanna? No, that's the EVAP system. EVAP and EGR gets confused quite a bit. That's, that's pretty common. But the EGR system, what it does is it takes exhaust gas and recycl or recirculates it back into the combustion chamber. 
Now, the reason they use exhaust gas is because theoretically, exhaust gas has no oxygen in it. We've used it all up in the combustion gas, or in the combustion process. So it's an inert gas. And what we're doing is we're trying to put an inert gas into the, the combustion chamber so that we can cool the combustion chamber down. Oxides of nitrogen form at, in mass quantities at temperatures above 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. So if we can keep the combustion chamber cooler than 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit, we're going to produce less oxides of nitrogen. Oxides of nitrogen, when they come out, they uh, go into the atmosphere and they uh, mix with uh, UV light and they form photochemical smog. And so that's why oxides of nitrogen are not good. And uh, catalytic converter helps with burning some of that stuff off. But if we can control the temperature in the, control, in the combustion chamber a little better, we can prevent them from even forming, the oxides of nitrogen from even forming. So that's what EGR does. And when we can control the valves, we can overlap the valves a little bit too. So when the intake valve starts to open up on the intake stroke, we can leave the exhaust valve open a little bit and allow some of that exhaust gas to come in during the intake stroke, which is the same thing as EGR. Now we can eliminate the EGR valve and we can just control that with, uh, with valve overlap. EGR valve, um, it really sucks. It does pull in, uh, power away from your engine and it tanks fuel economy a little bit too and stuff like that. But it's kind of that balance, the best of both worlds where you can, you can improve your, your tailpipe emissions without losing too much power. We're gonna be constantly talking about a teeter-totter effect. We want more power, we're gonna sacrifice fuel uh, emissions in economy. We want emissions in economy, we're gonna sacrifice power. So the idea is to balance the two so we get the best of both worlds. That's what the engineers are trying to do and, uh, and everything. We're trying to get the most power out of the engine as possible, but still keep the fuel, and fuel economy and the emissions uh, where they need to be as well. So making sense? Okay, let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break. When we come back, we'll uh, wrap this up. Okay, these next couple of slides that, are, uh, that we're going to go through, they're, ba they're basically just talking about the, the different um, steps in the four-stroke cycle. So uh, intake stroke, and this is every, uh, every 180 degrees. And I know this is a lot of reading on the slide, but um, attached to this, I've got that video. I would inc strongly encourage you to just kind of click on the video and watch it. And... Uh, um, where I break it down and I'll, I'll talk about each one of the strokes individually and you can see it on this little trainer engine. And then if you, uh, after you watch the video, if you want to play around with this thing, I'll show you how it works and you can start as long as you don't get your fingers stuck in the valves or something like that because that can uh, hurt. So just a uh, review, intake stroke, pistons coming down, drawing air into the combustion chamber or into the cylinder. Compression stroke, pistons coming back up, both valves are closed, and uh, um, it's compressing the air-fuel mixture. Power stroke is after we've ignited the air-fuel mixture and, and the combustion gases are expanding, they're pushing the piston back down. And exhaust stroke is after the combust combustion event occurs and uh, the piston's coming back up, exhaust valve is open, intake valve's closed, and it's pushing all the exhaust out of the engine. So the 720 degree cycle, uh, this is one that I used to, uh, sometimes I'll give a little quiz on this, but um, how do you figure out how many degrees of crankshaft rotation uh, between each firing on like a three cylinder versus a four cylinder versus a six cylinder or eight cylinder or whatever? Any idea of what, uh, how to figure that out? 720 divided by the number of pistons you have. So that'll give you, uh, for instance, with the three-cylinder engine right here, um, you drove, divide 720 by three, gives you 240 degrees in between each cylinder that fires. So the reason we need to know that is the fewer pistons you have, the rougher the engine's going to be a little bit because you have a larger degree of crankshaft rotation between each one of the cylinders firing. 
So there used to be a commercial on TV years ago that, uh, I'm trying to remember which manufacturer, it might have been Mercedes, I don't remember now. But anyway, they were advertising their, their uh, V10 engine and they had a stack of champagne glasses uh, on top of this engine. They were bragging about how smooth this engine was. You could rev it up and it didn't spill any champagne out of all the glasses that were stacked up on this engine. Well, it was a V10. How many degrees of crankshaft rotation between each cylinder fire? So it's going to smooth out. It's going to be nice and smooth. Or it's going to be a lot smoother, I should say, than, say, a four-cylinder or a five-cylinder or six-cylinder. So, and then the configuration of the, of the pistons is also going to help whether or not it's smooth. So a V configuration means the pistons are kind of at a V configuration like this. So like on this V6 here, the pistons are angled out in a V shape. In line, they're all in a straight line. And, uh, and so forth. So with a four-cylinder engine, 720 divided by four gives you 180 degrees. So 180 degrees each in between each one. Most commonly, we've got a lot of V8 engines out there. We have 90 degrees in between each, um, 90 degrees of crankshaft rotation in between each cylinder firing. Their GM made some uh, engines back in the 90s that, uh, they were V6 engines, and actually there were some four cylinders too that they made, that they actually put a counterbalance shaft inside the engine to kind of help smooth it out a little bit because of the, the configuration of the engine. It shook when the pistons were firing and it created a lot of issues. So they put a counterbalance shaft in there. It looked like a camshaft and you had to time it with the camshaft and the crankshaft. So when you replace the timing chain on those engines, you had to include that counterbalance shaft as well. And uh, it smoothed out the engine. So basically you have a counterweight going uh, opposite of your vibration. So it smooths everything out. Uh, anybody into motorcycles? Harley Davidson, they have a, most of their engines are V-twin. So they have two cylinders and they're in a v, v configuration like this. And the way they fire, they shake. But it also gives it that Harley sound that you get when you're revving those motorcycles down the road. Downside to that is most Harley Davidson motorcycles, you have to retorque everything on the engine every 20,000 miles because it shakes itself apart. So I drive a Goldwing and that Goldwing is a pancake configuration. The pistons are going out this way and there's six of them. There's six pistons, not just two. And it's really smooth. Never have to torque that engine. So. So that's, uh, and some of the, sometimes when you're talking to your customer, um, you have to educate them. So if they're driving a little Geo Metro with three cylinders and they're complaining about their engine being a little bit rough, well, sorry dude, can't add another piston to it. <laughs> you know, as long as everything's working, as long as the ignition system's okay and the fuel system's okay and all that stuff, it's gonna be a rough engine because it's only got three cylinders. So the, I think what saves the, the, the Metro is the fact that it's such a small engine. <laughs> it doesn't generate enough power to really shake very hard. So. Okay, I think we've talked about that. Um, so engine um, displacement. So the displacement is basically talking about the size of your cylinder, okay? Pistons at bottom dead center. We're going to measure how, how much volume do we have between the top of the cylinder and the bottom of the cylinder, and then what diameter the cylinder is. Okay? So you take the measurement of how tall it is and how big around it is, and do that calculation. That gives you your, your displacement on the engine. So that's how they calculate that. We're not, this isn't, I've, I haven't designed this class to really get into that very deep. You should have had that in your engines class. So um, to calculate um, displacement, you can use the displacement to also factor into um, um, horsepower and size. So if you talk about a, a 5.7 engine, 5.7 liters, that's what they're doing. They're talking about displacement. Okay, so it's this, this uh, area right here is 5.7 liters. So in uh, standard terms, we call it cubic inches. So the, so the metric term is liters and the cubic inches is 
is the, is the standard term. So, but anyway, so that's how they calculate the bore size. And then the stroke of the engine uh, is the the stroke of the engine is how far the piston travels up and down. They actually there are some engines out there. Personally, I've never seen one, but there are some engines out there that have articulated connecting rods, so you can get a longer stroke out of uh, out of a piston. So it has a not only does it connect to the cr the crankshaft here, but it also has another articulation. Uh, part way up the, the connecting rod so that way it can actually pull the piston down further and, and then it goes up higher in the because the stroke of the engine is how far it goes all the way down and how far it comes all the way up. So you can change the stroke on some engines a little bit by changing the connecting rod. So by putting a different connecting rod either a longer or shorter one in you can change the stroke of the engine. But a lot of times when you do that, it also involves machining this, the cylinder head a little bit or maybe the deck of the engine. The deck is where the cylinder head bolts onto uh, on the cylinder block. So, And then uh, some engines are called uh, odd fire engines. So if you notice on this crankshaft journal here, you've got two connecting rod journals, but they're offset from each other a little bit. So those pistons aren't going to reach top dead center at the same time. And part of the reason they do that is to help smooth out the engine a little bit. Um, a lot of engines, the, these, uh, when you have two connecting rods that are attached side by side on the, the, the crankshaft, that journal is just one piece. It's not offset like that. So there's the one liter equals 1,000 uh, cc's. Um, 61 cubic inches, so one cubic inch equals 16.4 cc's. So, and this talks about conversion. So, when in the chapter, when you go through this chapter, it's going to talk a little bit about how to convert and how to how to calculate the the combustions. And I think there might be one or two questions on your uh, chapter quiz that deals with uh, those. So, make sure you read through that chapter when you take your quiz. And by the way, those quizzes are open book, and uh, I didn't put a time limit on them, so you can refer back to your chapter if you need to while you're taking the quiz. So, Now, horsepower, definition of horsepower, and torque. So torque is the term used to describe the rotating force that may or may not result in motion. So when I have a wrench right here, if I grab hold of that wrench and I push down on it, I'm applying torque to that wrench. Whether or not this nut moves is irrelevant. I'm still applying torque to it. Okay, so that's the twisting motion of uh, of this. So one of the things we measure when it comes to piss or engines is the amount of torque or twisting power the engine can generate. So diesels typically generate a lot more torque than gasoline engines do. That's one of the reasons that they're popular. They can pull a lot of stuff you got a lot more torque and uh, they use less fuel when they do that. So with the diesel engine you could probably get a little bit more pulling power out of it with a similar amount of fuel economy than you could out of a gasoline engine. So that's one of the plus sides to it. So torque is measured um, as the amount of force applied by the length of the lever. Um, so how much, how many foot-pounds you're putting um, on the, the lever and how long the lever is, that's how you're going to calculate the amount of torque. Um, one of the things that this relates to us as technicians is uh, if you have, say, a ratchet. If you have a ratchet with a handle this long and you have a ratchet with a handle this long, which one's easier to break bolts with? The longer one, isn't it? So you have to be careful. When I, was, uh, whenever, when I was working in the industry and I would replace something like uh, oil pan gasket, right? The oil pan bolts that go into the oil pan that hold it up, they're only torqued at a very, very small amount of torque. So I used a small ratchet with a small handle. That way I couldn't over torque it very easily without putting some real effort into it. Now when you're taking lug nuts off from a car or trying to break loose a, a, a bolt, uh, 
a uh, crankshaft bolt or something like that, those are you, you need a lot of torque on those, and so you use a longer, longer handle wrench to get more torque on it, we'll get more leverage. I actually have a scar on this hand right here, where uh, I was I was doing something I wasn't supposed to be doing, doing a brake job. Well, the brake job I was supposed to be doing, but I was doing a brake job on a Cadillac. And the bolts that hold the caliper on were on the back side of the caliper. They were really tight and they weren't coming loose. And so rather than going over and getting the proper tool, I just grabbed two open end box end wrenches, combination wrenches. I put one on the, the thing and then with the open end going out like this, I hooked the box end in the other one to give myself a little more leverage. And I'm lifting up on the thing while the wrenches slipped and my hand slipped and I went up into the pinch weld and laid my hand open. So that's a little scar that reminds me every time to use the right tool. <laughs> I'm sure some of you probably have similar scars <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> I have a scar right here on my thumb too that reminds me, if a transmission falls, let it fall. Don't try to catch it. <laughs> so. so this gives you an example of uh, um, calculating torque. So uh, the metric for torque is Newton meters. So if you hear that term, that's what they're talking about. It's just a metric version of torque, Newton meters. So, so definition of power, the term means the rate of, of work that's being um, accomplished uh, divided by time. So that's, that's what we're talking about with power. So work is achieved when a certain amount of mass or weight is moved a certain amount of distance by force. So if I want to move this engine over here, the amount of power it takes to grab hold of this engine and pull it, um, that's, that's what you're talking about. So in a car or a engine performance scenario, how much power can, or how much movement can this engine generate um, in the car? So if you have a little three cylinder and a great big three quarter ton truck, it's probably not going to move the car or the truck very well. But if you have a V8, a nice size V8 in that same truck, it's going to move it a lot better because the V8 can generate more power. So power is expressed in units of foot pounds per minute and also, or and power also includes engine speed. So RPM is calculated into that. So for example, this may be listed as producing 20 or 280 horsepower at 400 and, or 4,400 uh, RPM. Has anybody had the opportunity to run the dyno yet? Uh, I think a couple of you have. Some of the things we measure on the dyno, that's what we're doing. Is we met, and that's why when you're doing a horsepower run on a dyno, you do it in a certain gear at a certain RPM. So that way you're measuring, you know, um, how much horsepower you're generating at whatever gear it is that you want to race in or whatever. So if you've got a car that's a sprint car, you probably want a lot of torque right off the line to get, off, get, get you off and going. But if you're a different application, you may want more higher end torque or more higher end power. So, and you can set your car up for doing whatever you want. So the, the power, the, this is horsepower. This is where horsepower comes in. So you guys have probably already heard this before, so hopefully it's a review. But the power of one horse was determined um, by James Watt, same guy who invented Watt's Law that he did in electricity. So he lived from 1736 to 1819, and he was a Scottish inventor who uh, first calculated the power of one horse while working a steam engine to remove water from coal mines. So that's where it came from, the horsepower. So uh, the, uh, the example of it is for an example, engine may be listed as producing 280 horsepower at 400 or 4,400 RPM. So very similar to this one, just a little bit different. Uh, so Now, horsepower and altitude, this is something we're going to be, uh, that's going to concern us as drivability techs. How does altitude affect the way the engine runs? Yeah, content of oxygen, exactly. So at sea level, right here at the college, we're at about 200 feet above sea level. Uh, so we're basically considered sea level. Uh, we, at sea level, we have um, approximately 
20% oxygen in the air. It's actually a little bit less than that, but uh, approximately 20% oxygen in the air. The higher up you go in altitude, the less oxygen you have, and also the less atmospheric pressure you have. So at sea level, we have 14.7 PSI for uh, atmospheric pressure. So that means that you're taking a one inch by one inch column of air from sea level all the way to the top of the atmosphere. You measure that one inch by one inch column of air and it's going to weigh 14.7 pounds. The higher up you go in altitude, the less that's going to, the, the lighter that's going to be. So the less atmospheric pressure you're going to have and the less oxygen content you're going to have in the, in the air. So one of the ways this made sense to me is back when I was teaching scuba diving, when we would fill air tanks, you'd take a 3,000 cubic foot tank and you fill it up with 3,000 p or sorry, a, an 80 cubic foot tank, and you fill it up with 3,000 uh, psi of air, it would increase the weight of the tank by almost six pounds. So putting that much air into that small of a tank actually made the tank heavier. So uh, it actually does um, weigh, air weighs a, a certain amount. So this affects us, for instance, um, if you have a customer that gets his car serviced here and then he drives to uh, someplace like uh, Denver, Colorado, so that's getting pretty close to a mile high uh, off the, uh, above, a, above sea level, that's going to change the way the engine runs. Now, this used to be more of a factor back in the carbureted days before computers, because computers can compensate for altitude nowadays. You have a barometric pressure on, sensor on your vehicle that is going to look at your altitude, and it's going to adjust your fuel delivery and everything else based on your altitude. So, but when I was working, for instance, when I was working in dealerships in Utah, um, the, alt the altitude was about 6,000 feet above sea level. And very seldom, when I was doing a vacuum test on a car, very seldom did I see 18 inches of vacuum. Most of the time it was 15, 16 inches of vacuum on the car. And it was simply because I was higher in altitude than I am here. Here at the college, we see 18 inches of vacuum quite frequently on a car, but we're at sea level. So altitude does pay a uh, factor into um, our uh, engine performance. This is what I'm talking about here with low density versus high density uh, air. So at a higher altitude, you're gonna have less dense air. So in other words, it's gonna be, there's gonna be less oxygen, there's gonna be less other, other gases in the air. At sea level, you're gonna have a higher density of air. So one of the things I've always wanted to do, one of these days I'm actually gonna go do it. I was gonna go down and get two plastic bottles that look identical fill one up with seawater and one up with fresh water and see if there's a difference. Because seawater is more dense than fresh water is. And just weigh them and see if there's a difference in there. One of these days I'm going to do that. And, uh, but if, you, if you're curious about that, that might be something. If you do it, let me know what you find. Um, but it's kind of interesting to, to think about that. So charge density, we're talking about um, when the piston comes down on the intake stroke, if you're at higher elevation, you're going to bring in less oxygen than you will at a lower elevation. So that makes a difference in how much fuel the engine needs to, or the PCM needs to deliver to the cylinder. Does that make sense? When we start talking about some of this stuff, if, if I get off into la-la land where it doesn't make sense, make sure you let me know, because it's making sense to me. <laughs> but if it's not making sense to you, it's not, I'm not doing my job, so. All right, so the greater the density of air charge forced into the cylinder, the greater the force produced by when it's ignited, and the greater the engine power. So this is where um, normally aspirated versus forced air induction comes in. Normally aspirated engine, that's a term we use for an engine that has no assist putting air into the combustion chamber. So in other words, it's just bringing natural, you know, the piston goes down, atmospheric air pushes air into the cylinder, and that's it. When you have forced air induction, that means that you have something forcing air into the combustion chamber. So you either have a turbo, you have a supercharger, you have something like that on there that's going to be forcing air in there. There's actually some pretty funny YouTube videos if you want to go on YouTube. Um, redneck superchargers, 
where guys have taken those battery powered leaf blowers and hooked them up to their cars and stuff. There's some pretty funny videos on that. So an engine that uses atmospheric pressure for its intake is called a normally aspirated engine. And uh, so um, nowadays it's becoming quite popular to add boost onto uh, engines. Um, for the simple reason that if you add a turbo to an engine, you can actually increase the power output of that engine. So in other words, we can make a smaller engine and we can still get more power out of it if we put a turbo or a supercharger on it. So anyway, so we got superchargers and turbochargers on here. Um, to, towards the end of the quarter, no? We've moved that so the turbos and superchargers are in the engine now, engine class. Did you guys cover turbos and superchargers in, the, in your engines class? Okay, so I can, hopefully we'll have time at the end of the quarter, I'll throw it in on this class and we can cover it. What's that? Oh. <laughs> no. Hopefully you won't say that about this class. So, um, so s superchargers work a little bit differently than turbos. Um, turbos are almost considered free energy because they're using the heat of the exhaust to um, power the turbine and, and force air into the engine. Whereas a supercharger is, is considered a parasite in a good way, <laughs> which it means that it's got a pulley on the front that's driven by the engine. So the supercharger is going to pull a little bit of power from the engine to produce a lot more power by forcing air into the combustion chamber. So with a supercharger, there's several different ways that you can operate them. You can turn on and off the pulley, um, kind of like an AC compressor, or you can change the diameter of the pulley to either add more boost or less boost, uh, different things like that. Um, and then with super or with turbos, I think I got turbos coming up here. Yeah, turbochargers. With a turbo, you've got uh, the turbine wheel and then you've got the compressor wheel. The turbine wheel is, is uh, in the exhaust, and so as the exhaust comes through the exhaust manifold, the heat of the exhaust forces the turbine to spin and in turn, it's, it's attached to, the compressor is attached to the turbine by a shaft, and that turbine is going to spin. It's going to force air in there. The downside to this is you really can't turn it off because it's exposed to the, the exhaust all the time. There are ways that you can go around it, like some turbos have a bypass. So when the bypass valve is, is turned on, it bypasses the exhaust and goes around the turbo so you're not spinning it. Um, but then there's also some that have valves that open and close that, that just blow off the extra turbo boost instead of routing it to the manifold, it just blows it off into the atmosphere. You know, there's different ways of controlling turbos. The one downside, or the difference between superchargers and turbos, superchargers, you have instant power, okay? So, because it's driven by the engine. So when you rev the engine, the turbo is going to speed up too. Or sorry, the supercharger is going to speed up too. But with a turbo, when you rev the engine, it's going to take a minute for that thing to spool, to spool up, to spin up. Uh, yeah, a second. <laughs> Thanks for that. But it's, uh, it's going to take a little bit for that thing to spool up. And that's called turbo lag. Okay, so you step on the gas and then you vroom, and then take off. <laughs> so, uh, and then a lot of turbos, um, they're getting pretty good at managing turbo lag too. So a lot of times you don't notice turbo lag too much on these. And on the bigger trucks, Sometimes they'll use two separate turbos. They'll use a small turbo to start spinning up the, the big turbo. So that lessens the turbo lag there too. So. so some of the advantages to, to superchargers, instant power. Um, some of the advantages to turbo is it's almost free power. Disadvantages, superchargers, you're robbing power from the engine to create power for the engine. Uh, turbos, you can't stop them. <laughs> Once they start spinning, they're spinning, and uh, unless you bypass the gas or something like that. So anyway, that's kind of in a nutshell. And we can, if we got time at the end of the quarter, we, we can spend a little more time talking about turbos and superchargers on those. So, uh, then, and there's also some uh, things as far as service goes that you really need to pay attention to as well on both of those, like.
superchargers, they, a lot of times they'll have their own oil reservoir that they have to, you have to change when you change the oil in the engine. A lot of times you're not changing the oil in the su supercharger. So it depends on the, the configuration setup. So, and with a turbo, um, you need to make sure that the exhaust is, uh, is clear and also that the shaft gets lubricated and cooled and stuff so it doesn't uh, seize up on you. So. That's uh, another picture of a turbo. So the impeller or the compressor, and here's a turbine wheel. If you notice, the fins on these are a little bit different on the compressor versus the turbine. A lot of times the, the turbine, it's kind of a cupped shape. So when the exhaust comes back, it catches it real easy. Whereas the compressor, it's kind of the, the fins are a little bit more laid back, so you're not blowing as hard. Um, you have a turbo, don't you, Eric, on your car? Yeah. How much boost does it usually produce? Yeah. Do you have one too, Jamie? No. Oh. Yeah. I, to be honest with you, I'm not a turbo expert. I'm not a supercharger expert either. Um, but uh, a lot of times, turbos and superchargers, either one, they're not throwing a whole bunch of air into the into the combustion chamber, but it is enough to really um, improve the the power output of the car. So. Questions on this chapter? Yeah, it looks like I beat you guys up today. <laughs> Either that or it's just early and you're getting back into the routine of school. <laughs> yeah. So just to kind of wrap up and, and summarize, um, make sure you read through this chapter before you try and take the quiz so that you can refer back to whatever questions are asked so that you can uh, look them up and, and that kind of thing. And then uh, um, tomorrow we are covering, let me take a look and see what we're covering tomorrow. Uh, yeah, it is chapter, well, no, I think I moved chapter four. Chapter six, in vehicle service. I bumped chapter four down to week two the oscilloscopes and DSOs because it, it fits better in next week. So tomorrow we're going to be cha covering chapter five, um, and uh, which is gasoline engine system, or sorry, chapter six, uh, vehicle in vehicle service. And uh, tomorrow is actually the last day that we're going to be in the classroom only. And then uh, the tasks that I have assigned this week, there, like I say, there's no expiration date on them, so we can start working on those next week. Um, remember Thursday, no class. I've got a doctor's appointment, so I'm not going to have class on Thursday. So Thursday, you can use Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday to uh, do your three homework assignments that you have. And then uh, Monday, the Monday, Monday, Tuesday group will come in on Monday morning. You don't need to be here until 8 o'clock on Monday. Um, and then we'll go from 8 to noon, basically. And uh, then Wednesday, Thursday group, same thing. So if you, do, if you are working on a project and you need to come in a little bit earlier to get a little bit more extra time in, the, in lab, just let, talk to me, let me know, because I can work with you on that, because I'll probably be here anyway. So, um, but anyway, so tomorrow will be very similar to today. We'll kind of go through the, the chapter. And, uh, and then I'll put these, these videos that I've recorded up on Canvas so you can refer back to them if you want to. Yesterday's lecture, there's a little bit missing, but uh, and then next week they'll be recorded uh, in Panopto, though, so they won't be YouTube. They'll be Panopto for from Monday on. So, any questions or comments or anything? Alrighty.